In this video, I'm gonna discuss my basic approach and search pattern in reading a CT of the abdomen and pelvis. This is a very commonly ordered exam, particularly in the emergency room setting where people are presenting with abdominal pain all the time, and it's difficult to know what's going on, so the CT of the abdomen and pelvis is a very useful test. Almost always, the radiologist is gonna prefer intravenous contrast. It helps the organs pop a little bit more. You can tell more about what's going on in the abdomen and pelvis, and it helps things stand out that maybe otherwise would be tough to catch. So we almost always recommend it with contrast. Of course, if the patient has an allergy, you don't want to do contrast. And there are some exceptions, like in kidney stones, a lot of times the recommendation is just a CT without contrast. Generally, when in doubt, order contrast. But if you have any questions, you can always call the radiologist. So now onto my search pattern. The first thing I look at is the thorax. You get a little bit of the lower thorax, and that includes the heart and lungs. So I take a look at the heart, checking for pericardial fluid, coronary artery calcifications, LV thrombus. Sometimes you can catch those in the left ventricle. When moving on from the heart, I then look at the lungs. I can't window it to look at the lungs on the program that I'm using, but I like to look at the lung parenchyma. You can ch check the pulmonary arteries for subtle pulmonary emboli. You actually can catch those, and I have had some cases where we've been able to catch those on a CT of the abdomen and pelvis. Check for pleural effusions. Those will layer dependently, kind of posteriorly within the pleural space. In patients that are sick in the hospital, a lot of them have renal disease, liver disease, cardiovascular disease, and they have pleural effusions because they're volume overloaded. So that's something to always comment on if you see it. Moving inferiorly to the abdomen and pelvis, I like to start with the liver. I pay attention to the contour of the liver. In this case, this I would say is normal, but a nodular liver contour is suggestive of cirrhosis. I also take a look at the density of the liver. This is a normal looking liver in terms of the density, but in cases of hepatic steatosis, the liver is darker than it should be, and it's closer to that of the fat. This is fat here along the posterior abdominal wall, so the liver is not quite that dark. I've never seen anything that dark, but the liver is darker than it should be, and that suggests fatty liver. I then like to look at the portal vein. Here's the portal vein here. Make sure there's no clot. You can also track them in the liver themselves, the branching different branches at the main portal vein. So I always look at that. I then like to go to the coronal and take a look at the common bile duct. I'll draw that because it's kind of hard to catch this case the common bile duct is not dilated so it's hard to see but it's this right up below the portal vein that's the common bile duct there and that's a normal caliber i then stay in the coronal and look at a lot of the other upper abdominal organs here's your spleen in your left upper quadrant i take a look at that paying attention to the size looking for any splenic lesions of course take a look at your gallbladder here is the gallbladder here this is a normal looking gallbladder. I don't see any obvious stones. A lot of stones will show up on CT, some won't, and you'll see them on ultrasound instead. So there's our gallbladder. I then look for the adrenal glands, and I'm gonna circle the adrenal gland because it's kind of hard to see, especially for the beginner. The adrenal gland looks a little bit like the Mercedes-Benz logo, and here's the adrenal gland on the left. And as you can see, it looks kind of like the Mercedes-Benz logo. So look at your adrenal glands. Look at your pancreas. This is the pancreatic tail here that I'm circling with my mouse. The pancreas crosses the midline. You have the pancreatic body and then the head kind of meets the duodenum and you obviously have the confluence of all the, all the ducts and they empty into the duodenum. But pancreatitis is something that a CT is commonly ordered for so you are sure to take a close look at the pancreas on every CT. I then take a look at the kidneys. I think the coronal view is a good place to look at the kidneys. Here's the left kidney. Here's the right kidney. I look at how the kidneys are enhancing. They should enhance pretty symmetrically on both sides. And if there's any altered enhancement of the kidneys, you worry about something like pyelonephritis. I then look at the collecting systems to make sure there's no hydronephrosis. In this case, there's no hydronephrosis. You can track the ureters down in the coronal view and just look to see if you can catch a stone. I sometimes like to go to the axial and track those ureters inferiorly as well. But those are the kidneys. I then go back to the axial and look at the upper digestive tract. I start with the distal esophagus. Here's the esophagus here next to the aorta. Track that down. It enters into the stomach. Here's your big stomach here. Then the stomach empties into the small bowel. You're looking for thickening of the stomach wall, inflammatory changes that could suggest gastritis, a lot of different things you're looking at in the stomach. I then look at the small bowel, and the big thing you want to catch is a small bowel obstruction. In this case, this small bowel. First, it's filled with oral contrast. So this patient, this brightness here, that's oral contrast that the patient swallowed. So there's intravenous and oral contrast on this exam. But 
you're looking to make sure that the small bowel is not super dilated to suggest there's an obstruction. So I always take a look at that. And then I go all the way down to the rectum distal colon and track the colon. Things you can comment on are diverticulosis, diverticulitis, of course, where one of those diverticula is inflamed, dilation of the colon, changes of colitis like fat stranding or pericolonic edema. Then always you always want to find the appendix too. Here is the appendix. I'm going to circle it. I'll make sure the patient does have appendicitis. I then go down to the pelvis. I take a look at the bladder here. Here's the bladder. And then the reproductive organs. In this case, this is a male. So here's the prostate. Take a look at the prostate. You can catch a prostatic abscess if the patient's having lower pelvic or perineal pain. So it's important to take a look at the reproductive organs. In this case, we've got the prostate to look at. General things to keep in mind are looking for free air. Free air would rise. Air rises, so you'd see it up here. So you're looking for free air. You're looking for fluid in the abdomen, something like ascites. And you're also looking at lymph nodes. So there are different lymph node stations. In this case, you think about in the retroperitoneal area around the aorta. You look for lymph nodes there. If you scroll more inferiorly, in the pelvis, there are a lot of lymph nodes you have to look out for. And you're looking for big ones. You'll see normal not enlarged lymph nodes all the time. For instance, here are the inguinal nodes. And these can get quite big and still be normal, but they're inguinal lymph nodes here. So you're always thinking about the lymph nodes as you're scrolling through a case. I take a look at the aorta, comment on the degree of calcification. Here's the aorta here, and just track it all the way down. It splits into the iliac vessels, and then becomes the femoral vessels. Then there's your inferior vena cava, which is here. And I want to make sure there's not a clot in the inferior vena cava. It can kind of be hard because contrast tends to kind of mix in the IVC. But I always track my IVC down all the way to the iliofemoral systems. And sometimes you can even catch a deep venous thrombosis. I then take a look at the abdominal and pelvic walls. So I'm looking posteriorly here and I just track it all the way up. Looking for different things. You can catch masses, inflammatory changes, all sorts of stuff. So I just kind of track the entire outer wall of the body and I'm just looking for anything that I can find, paying attention to the muscles. And in this case, this is a pretty normal looking abdominal wall. I'm not seeing anything major. So after doing that, I like to go to the sagittal and start looking at the bones. This is not a window that is optimized for looking at the bones, but I'm looking at the vertebral body heights, looking for fractures, always pay attention to the hips, the pelvic bones. I like to look at the hips and the coronal and I always recommend doing that. Here's just Left hip here, right hip here. You don't want to miss an osseous lesion in a patient with metastatic cancer. So a gander at the bones is always important. And you don't want to miss a big fracture. Sometimes the subtle ones are hard and you do miss them. We all miss stuff, but try not to miss the big things in the bones. It can be easy to just overlook the bones and not pay attention to them when you're trying to get through a case quickly. In this case, these bones look okay. Well, there you have it. That is my basic introductory approach to the CT of the abdomen and pelvis. As you start reading these yourself, you'll develop your own search pattern. You'll develop a deeper understanding of what you're looking for. This was not meant to be an exhaustive review of all the things that you can find in the abdomen and pelvis. There are all sorts of things. As you get more experience, your search pattern will evolve and you'll just get better. But I hope that is at least a good starting point for you so you can watch this video, take what you learned, and then apply it in your work. And then as you see a lot of these different cases, as your experience grows, you'll become better and hopefully you can build off this initial video. Thanks so much for watching and see y'all next time.